Hilmar Brock, being the chairman of the uh, Committee for Foreign Policy within the European Parliament, mm. you have been the rapporteur on uh, the uh, statement, can I call it this way, of uh, Madame Mogherini, the uh, commissioner in charge of uh, foreign relations. Are you satisfied this time? I have interviewed you before after these annual meetings and you were not always satisfied. Today? No, I'm not yet satisfied because uh, we have not reached a new level until now, but uh, there's a perspective to reach it. Uh, Mrs. Mogherini is only a short time in office. A lot of things have to be changed. I have the impression that he's trying to do so. It's going in the right direction. Uh, she has also reconciled the real role she has to do, being on one part uh, the communitarian foreign relations office and the other side the intergovernmental one. Uh, that is this double-headed thing and she is really uh, trying to do that now what Mrs. Ashton never did. One of the things you are asking is that things are more coordinated, correct? It's coordinated and we have to see that the European Union has in part the there is full responsibility in foreign relations, in trade, development policy, in neighborhood policy, enlargement policy. But when it comes more to security and defense policy, it's intergovernmental in the hands of member states. It can only be decided in the council. And she has to fulfill both roles and have to put it together to one political message, to one political action. And she's not trying to do so. Mrs. Ashton was purely on the intergovernmental side. And this is a proper change. She is running now the cluster of the foreign relations commissioners, which is, I think, a real improvement to come to a one world policy and a coherent approach. Reading your report, there are that many um, subjects to be dealt with. Where do you put the priority uh, at the top? Which problem is, in your opinion, the most important to solve? First of all, we have to see our own weaknesses where we can still change our structures, uh, where we can have, uh, especially in foreign and security policy, a better approach, where we can have synergy effects in defense policy by using permanent structural cooperation. And common, that's behind the Juncker idea uh, yeah. of a common European But arm. it's a condition yeah. for that. But it's all possible with the Treaty of Lisbon. It's a question of political will from the member states. If we have structural, uh, permanent structural cooperation, then uh, countries who want to go forward can do so and have not to wait for all 28 countries. It's foreseen in the treaty. Uh, and uh, then it's a question of procurement. It's so expensive. The European Union has three times so many, so, uh, uh, more soldiers than the United States and gives three times so much money for defense as in America. This a very low result. We have armies in Europe which have overhead costs of 60, 70, 80 percent, uh, because uh, everyone wants to make its own ammunition if I overstate it a little bit. If we look at security, which could perhaps even um, be ha to be handled military, uh, it's the energy security. How do you foresee the development on that field? I think this is quite positive development because we have the interconnectivity now more and more. Uh, that is for Russia, for example, not any more possible uh, that uh, they can stop the supply for one country than most you are able that the other countries can deliver to such a country and to, that Russia stops this for all the countries would make Russia bankrupt because they depend on selling gas at all to the European Union. And this, I think, has strengthened us, but it can be done much more better. But also we have to consider how can we diversify uh, our supply. Uh, is it better to have a joint approach in that question or that does everyone support another line? Uh, is everyone racing somewhere else, uh, else or do, should we do it uh, together because that gives at the end of the day more security for everyone. And energy is a political weapon. It was always in the history of mankind. Is that uh, also a little bit behind your request, just mentioned in one and a half line, to have a EU representation in Tehran? I think if it would be possible, that's a condition for that, that we in this nuclear question come to an agreement, then if I think we should do that. I think that's the condition. If these negotiations will fail, then I am against such a um, uh, delegation embassy there. But I hope this will be possible in the course of this summer. And then I think uh, to be helpful to moderate uh, 
Iranian foreign policy endeavor can use also the energy, the gas and oil from, uh, from Iran in a better way. But and then by it that, makes me less dependent on Russia. But by that you are saying that you could foresee a situation where you can persuade the Iranian government not to support the terrorist IS? No, they do not support IS. They support the other line. Yeah, the okay. Shiites, the it's Arab. very difficult to see who yeah. they support. Uh, that is true. That is the question where we have to talk to Saudi Arabia and Iran, where everybody is a part of a proxy war. Now partly also Turkey playing a role in such proxy wars if I look to Libya. That is, I think is one of the main causes, uh, main uh, points we have to use. Uh, the King Abdullah has said in the European Parliament, this is first of all uh, the responsibility for the Muslim states. And here we should do a diplomacy that will bring the Muslim countries closer together uh, and also break this proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which plays even a role, the deciding role for the division of countries like Lebanon. It's all this proxy war and therefore I think uh, uh, this should be a part of the diplomacy of the European Union. It's not the direct action we do there that should take themselves responsibility for that. We cannot fight everywhere. We can support, but not take the lead everywhere. And here the countries in the region have to take their own responsibility in fighting terrorism. But by that we are getting closer to the Turkish question. Mm -hmm. In your report you are stating that's not satisfying the way it runs. You would like a tighter cooperation. Do you think under the present system in Turkey that is possible at all? Uh, we hope so, and we want to go to Turkey and talk to the uh, Turkish government about this in the upcoming days. Uh, and uh, I believe that it would be also in the Turkish interest, but it's also in our interest. If Turkey goes into the fundamentalist camp, it would be a disaster for security policy, but also for energy supply, because Turkey is very much needed, uh, needed as a transition country in this case, and therefore we have to try whether there's still a possibility uh, that uh, uh, we can come to an understanding with Turkey. But what I hear in certain occasions when I travel in that region um, uh, makes me concerned. To finalize this uh, statement during the um, assembly here, how about Minsk? Is it at all possible to believe now it will come to an end of the killing people and destroying the area in East Ukraine? We see in this moment that it more or less works, but it's just a ceasefire, not a solution. And uh, if uh, it can become so stable that a political solution is possible. We do also not know whether this is now the basis on that Putin is ready to find a political solution or takes it as, just as a pause before he goes to Mariupol and further places. Exactly. And this nobody of us knows, but it's very clear that the sanctions will be only lifted if uh, Minsk is fully implemented uh, and uh, that uh, the sanctions will increase if you will destroy Minsk. But you're still talking about a diplomatic solution? Yeah, I think at the moment we have Regardless a chance. Regardless what? No, to, to, in a moment we have a chance to fulfill Minsk. There is more or less a ceasefire. Uh, the heavy weapons are taken away from the direct fighting zones. That is part of it, but it's not everything. It's but not voices are, voices are raised to put more pressure on him by perhaps saying a little bit strength up uh, could uh, persuade him to give up his position in Kremlin? No, look, I think if we have now found an agreement where in a part of the, of the, of the implementation, that is then not a moment to increase sanctions because uh, then it would understand that side that we have broken Minsk. So, but the sanctions work. They put a lot of economic pressure on Russia. And uh, therefore, let's uh, give not him the impression that we will lift the sanctions, but we stick to the sanctions until Minsk is fully implemented. And if it's not, and he goes forward, he gets more sanctions. So he has to carry the costs of his behavior. That's very sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.